The presenting sponsor of the Athletic Fantasy Baseball Show is Tops.com and Tops Project 70. Tops is celebrating the 70th anniversary of its very first baseball card design with a new program that pushes boundaries while paying homage to its heritage. Project 70 has brought together creators of all kinds for this extraordinary set. Graphic designers, tattoo and graffiti artists, animators, illustrators, painters, and even a jeweler make up the artist roster, which includes names like Snoop Dogg, Action Bronson, Ben Baller, Jeff Staple, Tyson Beck, Alex Pardee, and more. Each artist will select their own MLB players and tops designs from any year to craft a unique story. Ever wanted to know what Babe Ruth or Mickey Mantle would look like in a 1980s tops design? Or how about Fernando Tatis Jr. in a classic template from the 1950s? Now you can see that and a whole lot more. Three new cards launch daily all year long on tops.com. I only see hours before they are gone for good. Head to tops.com to learn more about Project 70 and to check out which cards are live right now. All right, everybody, what's up? Welcome into the Athletic Fantasy Baseball Podcast. We are brought to you, as we've been all season long, by Tops and Tops Project 70, celebrating 70 years of Tops baseball cards. Michael Beller and Derek Van Riper here with you on this first day of July. DVR heading toward the end of the first half of the baseball season. I mean, we got to talk about some all-star teams here today, don't we? We do. It's going to happen. And by the way, I was looking at the Project 70 page this morning. It's the best combination of cards across the board that I've seen yet. There's actually an 83 Derek Jeter design up right now. I don't even like Jeter, but I love that 83 (laughs) set so much that I'm tempted to go buy that. He better have been a great defensive shortstop if he played in the early to mid 80s. (laughs) The athleticism might have matched up pretty well. Uh, Yeah, I guess that's, that's one way to look at it. (laughs) <laughs> all right well we were gonna t- we are gonna get and do some all-star team stuff some waiver wire all-stars uh in the fantasy baseball world but first as we do every thursday we've got a couple of beat writers for you to come on and provide the on the ground expertise on their teams and first we are going to start in cleveland where we find our cleveland beat writer zach mizell zach what's going on how you doing fellas we are doing good. We are doing, I would say, um, maybe as good as uh, a Cleveland could potentially be doing with Fran Mill Reyes coming back this weekend. A surprisingly competitive team. I don't think anyone necessarily expected them to be in this point close enough to the White Sox to still consider themselves players in the AL Central as we get close to the All-Star break. I want to start this, however, with uh, Ahmed Rosario. It's already been sort of a tale of two seasons for Rosario in this first half. A really brutal start to the season. Wasn't even an everyday player, and then things really started clicking for him uh, in mid-May, and he has made himself into an everyday player hitting at the top of this lineup. What clicked for him? What changed for him at that point, and what have we seen from him going forward from there? Yeah, you know, it's weird. The The thing with him, I mean, we all know he was one of the top prospects in baseball. I think our buddy Keith Law had him um, in the top two or three in 2017. And so you knew there was potential in there and he has pretty well-rounded skill set where he's got blazing speed and he can hit line drives to the opposite field and he, he can hit extra bases. Um, but it, it's, it's, we, we don't know what to make of the 2020 season and his was really rough. His 2019 season, a breakout year and, and he was really good for the Mets. So, I think we're all still trying to learn exactly what this player is and what his his skill set can produce numbers wise. So I think part of it is just maybe this is more who he is than who he was in April. And I think they feel that he's also a little bit more comfortable. Just he played center field for the first month. They were trying to get Andres Jimenez in there at shortstop. Jimenez didn't hit. So they moved Rosario to short. Rosario had never played outfield. He was playing center field every day, trying to learn a new position. So a lot on his plate early. And I think he's just been able to to settle in at shortstop and, and focus on one thing. So that's helped. But more so just, I mean, there's a little bit of like Tim Anderson light in, in there where he's just so good at slapping singles and doubles into the gaps and, and then running the bases. And that's, that's an interesting player. Um, so I think it's more so just maybe this is who he is and it's, it's the guy that no, he, he's not going to produce like you would hope the number three prospect in baseball would produce, but still a pretty productive, um, player that you can put at the top of your lineup. Just thinking about Jimenez for a second too, and how he kind of fits with Rosario playing shortstop again, Jimenez is putting up some pretty good numbers at triple a after a pretty rough start in Cleveland. 
Uh, if he comes back up in the relative near future, what does the defensive alignment look like to make the pieces fit? Yeah, so it's kind of awkward. Um, they actually <laughs> didn't even really consider they they had an opportunity to make a roster move when Josh Naylor got injured over the weekend, and um, they needed to add an outfielder. And in my mind, I was thinking the move I would have made was calling up Jimenez because he's hitting the ball really well. He's a really good defender at shortstop. Their defense, like that's the other thing. Like Ahmed Rosario's defense at shortstop has always been pretty lousy. That hasn't improved. I think we know what he is defensively. So you could have called up Jimenez, moved Rosario back to center, and maybe improved your offense and your defense. They didn't even give that thought. Um, so that tells me that they don't want to mess with Ahmed Rosario right now. They want to just keep him at shortstop, not make him think about anything else but hitting, um, which makes me think, okay, well, at some point you do need to call up Jimenez if he's going to keep hitting like this. And do you put him at second base and move on from Cesar Hernandez? Do you play Do you, do you play someone somewhere out of position? I mean, it's, it's not an easy fix. At some point you're going to have to move Ahmed Rosario off shortstop because – you have better options there. And they've got other kids in the system who are more likely to be the long-term solution at that spot than he is. So at some point they'll have to make that move, but I guess they're not ready to do that yet. Someone we know who is going to fit into this lineup, no matter what, so long as he's healthy, is Jose Ramirez. Uh, fouled the ball off of his face in game one of that doubleheader yesterday. Did not play in game two. Uh, you said you uh, you got home like, a, like eight hours ago, as you said, when we uh, before we got started here. So not going to ask you for too much, but is there any early word on uh, where, where Ramirez stands after that injury yesterday? He's totally fine. He went to – I mean, he stayed in the game. Uh, mm -hmm. for an inning after he fouled the uh, first of all how does that happen what sort of <laughs> physics does it require to foul a pitch off of your cheek um, but he went and got checked out at a local hospital in between games and they checked him out he was fine he came back put on his helmet put on his uniform grabbed a bat and told Terry Francona he wanted to go in the game so uh, he's okay I'd expect him to not miss much time or any at all um, which is good because yeah. I, that's not something I've ever seen. I wouldn't even know how to diagnose that or estimate how much time someone would miss from a bruised and swollen face. Yeah, definitely some good news there that he appears uh -huh. to be okay. Uh, Zach, I want to ask you about Bobby Bradley. A couple of home runs in the doubleheader, up to eight now in 78 plate appearances. Should we be comfortable assuming that he is an everyday player in this lineup? Yeah, and I think, I mean, Josh Naylor's injury is definitely tough uh, on the team and the roster and they were really hoping he would start to click and, and prove he can be an everyday big leaguer but him being out uh, means that Bobby Bradley there's no one else that's going to play first base they were mm -hmm. cycling in Yu Chang there a little bit early in the season but he just he has never hit this year so it's Bobby Bradley's spot and the early returns have been so impressive we've known he can hit for power uh, but there was always fear that he was going to strike out 40% of the time in the majors. Strikeout rates down a little bit so far. I don't know. I mean, that that could very well trend back up. But the fact that it's not just – he used to be the guy who he was big and strong and burly. And so if you threw him a fastball that he could turn on, he would yank it down the line for a home run. But like half of his home runs this year have been off-speed pitches, off-lefties – to the opposite field. Um, so this is a more complete polished hitter, I think, than we've seen in the past or that we projected him to be. He lost a ton of weight, but he didn't get, um, he didn't lose any of his, his power. He wears his jersey. It's like unbuttoned to his belly button. So, you know, he's feeling confident. And he's <laughs> he feels like he belongs. So yeah, it, he's, he's really intriguing because I, I think, they went with Jake Bowers first. That didn't work. And I think the thought was, well, Bobby Bradley might not be the long-term answer either, but might as well throw him in there. And I know it's only been a few weeks. He's been fantastic. 
Yeah, definitely a guy who is uh, starting to get uh, plenty of notice in the fantasy baseball world right now. This rotation always gets plenty of notice in the fantasy baseball world. Obviously, we know that this has been a banged up version of the Cleveland rotation this year, but some good news coming on a few of these guys. Zach Plesak made a rehab start, appears on his way back. We know Aaron Savali going to be out for another month or so. Where do things stand, however, with the guy at the very top of this rotation, Shane Bieber? Yeah, he had a scan on his shoulder this week um, that came back clean. So their their thought, their hope is maybe in another week he can start to, to a throwing program. He's basically doing everything with the rest of his body first right now. Um, it, it's tough. It, you have three your, – your, your three horses, basically the only three – starting pitchers on this roster with experience and they're all out. Um, but they aren't those injuries that, you know, it's, it's not like Corey Kluber who you knew he was going to be out two or three months. Um, these are injuries where it's basically just like Zach Plesak with a broken finger. The second that heals, he can start throwing and, and ramping things up and they can bring him back when he's ready. And with Aaron Savali, it's the same thing, a, a finger injury where you're just, like he feels great. He's just waiting for that stupid thing to to heal and, and mm-hmm. not be at risk. And with Bieber, it's a little different, obviously, with the shoulder. Um, but it, it's basically just he's in this rest period and they're just waiting for him to feel good so that he can pick up a baseball and, and start playing catch and going from there. So uh, all three of these guys, it's I think uh, Police Act will be the first one back. Um and then Beaver and Savali are probably looking toward the end of the month or, or sometime in August. Zach Cleveland enters play on July 1st, 42 and 35. A bit of a surprise, I think, to some of us who thought that things could fall apart after that Lindor trade. They're four back of the White Sox in the Central. Clearly, adding money doesn't seem like a, a priority in the front office or in the ownership group right now. But what could this team possibly add at the deadline? Yeah, so they're going to... They're typically aggressive. I think people don't realize that. Um, they usually make moves, and they don't need to always be the, the favorite to win the division or to win the pennant to to be aggressive. I think back to 2011, they were they were coming off a few 90 loss seasons. Um, they got off to a, a really hot start with Manny Acta at the helm, but you knew it was smoke and mirrors. And they headed into the the trade deadline a little bit above 500. They weren't going to win the division. They weren't going to be a playoff team. But they believed that it was the start of something. And they went out and traded for Ubaldo Jimenez, who was the big fish that summer. And I think people were scratching their heads because it didn't make a ton of sense that season. He wasn't going to elevate them into World Series contender. But he helped them that year. And he was a piece that could really help them for two years after that. And that's the sort of trade I think they would explore this summer where they don't want to outbid anybody for a rental. Um, They know that adding, they need rotation help badly, obviously, but adding one veteran starting pitcher and with the way that market is shaping up where everybody needs pitching, there's only a handful of reliable starting pitchers out there who would be available they're not going to pay that price. But what they would do is, especially another factor, and this is getting into the weeds, but they've got a huge 40-man roster issue coming where they've got like 15 minor leaguers they've got to protect. And then they'll probably want to protect eight to 10 of them this offseason. And there's no space to do that. So what you could see them do is package a few prospects for whether it's a pitcher or where they really need help in the outfield someone who's under control for three, four more years. Um, and that could give them a lift right now, but but more importantly, help them for the next few seasons. And they have the lower level minor league depth to, to pull something like that off. So it might seem strange. I think people always want to say, are you a buyer? Are you a seller? Like I had, it wouldn't shock me depending on how the next few weeks go, if they moved like Cesar Hernandez, but also traded for, you know, potential all-star center fielder who could help them for through 2024 something like that 
That's exactly where I want to go. Let's explore this from the other side of the discussion. It is a very tough couple of weeks coming up for this Cleveland team, starting a four-gamer with Houston later today. Then they get the Rays for a three-gamer after that. They come home to play the Royals. Then they've got a six-game road trip to Oakland and Houston and four more with Tampa, and that's just over the next couple of weeks. That is a very tough schedule that this team is facing down. So let's say things just <clears throat> excuse me, fall apart over these next couple of weeks. You mentioned Cesar Hernandez. Anyone else who could find his way out of Cleveland if things do come off the rails for this team? That's pretty much it. Um, the only other person who would make sense would be Eddie Rosario, but they they just don't have outfielders. Um, and he, I don't know how much value he would even have because he's had pretty lousy seasons. So mm-hmm. that's about it. I, it. It's so weird because they, you know, they they have all these injuries. You, you look at this roster, the active roster right now, and you'd say, okay, this is not, this isn't even a 500 team. And then you look at the schedule they've played recently where they've had Baltimore and Minnesota and Detroit and Pittsburgh, and they've struggled against those teams, but they've played the good, they, like they've played so well against the White Sox and the, the good teams. So it boggles my mind. I mean, you think about a rotation of JC Mejia and Sam Hentges and some mystery pitcher on Sunday facing the Houston Astros lineup. And it's, I mean, it could be a bloodbath, but oddly this team has played better against better competition. So I'm not sure. I think they think that like, they'll be okay. Although they've privately wondered if what they're doing is, is sustainable too. So yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. And, and I also, I think because of just where they're at roster wise, they have the youngest roster in baseball. It's just, this might go south in a hurry, but it mm-hmm. shouldn't impact trade deadline decisions too much just because they don't have much to sell and the buying they would do would be a long-term move and not just for immediate help. Well, this is going to be a fun weekend, I think, ahead for this team. Derek's heard me say this more than a few times. There are some of us right here, perhaps, who are very much looking forward to to getting Fran Mill Reyes back this weekend uh, because of some things were invested in in the fantasy world. That's Zach myself, very invested in the Cleveland baseball team here covering for them for us at The Athletic. Zach, thanks again for joining us. You got it, fellas. Take care. Look, no one's perfect. Even the best baseball players strike out with the brace, bases loaded. Hopefully not Fran Mill Reyes, though, when he returns, right? The best golfers, sometimes they three-putt with the tournament on the line. So if you feel like you come up short in the bedroom, sometimes it's perfectly okay. If it's bothering you, there are options. Go to GetRoman.com slash FBPod now. With Roman, you can get a free online evaluation and ongoing care for ED, all from the comfort and privacy of your home. A U.S.-licensed healthcare professional will work with you to find the best treatment plan, and if medication is appropriate, it ships to you free with two-day shipping. The whole process, it is straightforward, it is simple, and it is totally discreet. Getting started, that's really simple, too. All you got to do is go to GetRoman.com slash FBPod and complete an online visit. Take care of your ED without leaving home. Complete an online visit today to connect with a doctor and take care of it. Go to GetRoman.com slash FBPod now to get $15 off your first month. Look, there's a straightforward way to take care of your ED. GetRoman.com slash FBPod. Get started now to get $15 off your first month of treatment. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery store trips so you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in just about 30 minutes or less. You know HelloFresh has all sorts of meals that you can cook with your family and have fun with, but they've also got these really quick and easy, already pre-made things. 15 to 20 minute dinners, breakfast on the go, easy options for your busy lifestyle, menu and market items, including ready-to-eat salads, sandwiches, and soups. Go to HelloFresh.com slash MLB 14 Use that same code, MLB 14 and you will get up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. Again, that is HelloFresh.com slash MLB 14 Use the code MLB 14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. All right, moving right along here on this episode of the Athletic Fantasy Baseball Podcast. Our thanks once again to Zach Mizell for joining us. And we move on to our second beat writer of the day, Matt Gelb of the Philadelphia Phillies, or covers the Philadelphia Phillies for us here at the Athletic. Matt, how's it going today? Good, guys. What's going on? Uh, nothing much, man. We're uh, we're you know joking around with you before we got going about this this Phillies team stuck in neutral yet again. Uh, but one guy who is not stuck in neutral. Let's start on a positive note. There's a lot of negatives we can get to in this team. One guy who's not stuck in neutral, Zach Wheeler, having just an excellent season 
for this Philadelphia Phillies team. Uh, you know, Jacob DeGrom obviously running away with the Cy Young. If he weren't, we could be having a fun Zach Wheeler, Brandon Woodruff sort of debate, but it's all DeGrom's. It's just a race for second at this point, but still doesn't take away from what Zach Wheeler has done this season. Has anything changed for him, for him finding this gear that always seemed latent in his skill set, but now has appeared this season? I mean, I just think that his slider, he calls it, a, he throws a slider and a cutter. They have similar uh, pitch characteristics, but it's just been, it's been such a good pitch for him. He's commanded his fastball. He's throwing it for strikes. And really, when he can throw the slider slash cutter for strikes, too, uh, it's it's a really impressive combination. And last year, we saw a guy who was pitching more to contact. He was looking for uh, quicker innings, more ground balls. This year, we've seen a guy who can do it all. Like, he's getting strikeouts. He's getting ground balls when he needs them. Yeah, I mean, like, he has been incredible. He really has. And you're right. If it wasn't for DeGrom, I feel like – more people would be talking about Wheeler. I still feel like more people should be talking about Wheeler anyway. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, I think the big question now is going to be how many innings does he get this year, right? I mean, he's 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 never topped 200 in his career. You know, I don't know how many guys are going to throw 200 innings this year, but he's on pace right now for like 220, 225. I mean, they've really rode him hard here, and he's been fine with it. He likes pitching deep into games. Uh, I think that's been the one knock on him in the past, right, is that he, you know, not durable injuries, you know, hasn't had 32, 33 starts in the season. Um, that, that, I think that's a big question for him in the second half is like how many innings is he going to throw for them? I think back during draft season, Matt, we talked to you about Spencer Howard, and we were hoping that he was going to be a, a breakthrough member of this rotation, obviously with some workload restrictions or kind of a hybrid role working some in the pen, some in the rotation. The first half has not been good for Spencer Howard, but Bailey Falter has emerged to do some pretty interesting things. So what are your your early impressions of Falter, and could he maybe be the guy that provides some of those unexpected high-quality innings that a lot of us were expecting from Howard? I think it's possible, Derek. I do. Uh, He's not in the rotation for now. I mean, they're going to – they talked about maybe doing six-man for the rest of the first half up into the break. They're not going to do that as of now. So Matt Moore – is back in the rotation. He made uh, a solid start against the Mets. He'll pitch against the Padres over July 4th weekend, like tenuous. I mean, like, I don't know how long they'll ride Matt Moore and Bailey Falter would be that next guy up. And he is certainly interesting. You know, he's throwing like 92, 93, but he has this incredible stride. He releases the ball closer to home plate than just about any pitcher in the majors this year. I think there may be one or two guys, maybe Logan Gilbert, who has a better extension, and so that 92 mile hour fastball is looking like 95, 96. I mean, it's a, and he's from the left side. It's interesting. I, I think if he goes into the rotation, there are some real questions about a third pitch. You know, right now he's very heavy fastball slider and it works. It's worked, uh, you know, as a reliever and, and he, and he's pitched longer stints. I mean, it's been like a three or four inning, you know, usually come in. Uh, it's not like he's facing uh, only three or four guys. Like he, he's done it. Uh, I, I, I don't know. You know, that third pitch, like a changeup, like it's not a great pitch for him right now. So I think maybe you, might, as a starter, you could see that exposed a little bit. But you look at the guy's track record in the minors, he he throws strikes uh, and he doesn't get hit hard. Uh, he's he's really interesting. And I think he's going to get a shot in the second half to be in their rotation. I really do. Let's stick in the bullpen for a second. Hector Neris on again, off again. Relationship with the closers role is once again off, and this time looking for good. Should we expect some sort of timeshare in the ninth inning between Jose Alvarado and Archie Bradley for the remainder of the season? And obviously this assumes that no one gets shipped out, but let's just take that uh, as it is right now. Is it a timeshare with Alvarado and Bradley, or do you think one guy emerges as the primary option? (laughs) <laughs> the Phillies bullpen is a mess, and <laughs> I think any proclamations about like what's going to happen are are just our guesses right now. I mean, they really are because I think this thing is changing day by day, week by week. They like Alvarado in that role. He's he's pitched okay in that role. Honestly, they've <laughs> they've asked him to get five out saves, four out saves. He's mm-hmm. thrown he's had some thirty plus pitch outings here. Um, they've you know they've asked a lot of him, and I think. It's interesting because he is their best lefty reliever and and there are going to be times where uh, the matchup is better in the eighth inning. And so then you might see Bradley be the guy who gets the ninth inning because they want Alvarado facing some lefties in the eighth inning. So 
that's what makes sort of plotting out the save splits, you know, uh, the timeshare a little difficult because of the, because of Alvaro's left-handedness. I wouldn't rule out Maris as a guy of getting more <laughs> saves at some point. <laughs> also, if they manage to stay in this thing and they're buyers at the deadline, like yeah. an eighth or ninth inning guy is probably their top priority. You know, that's something that they would be buying if they are, you know, if they are buyers. So <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think Alvaro is <laughs> the guy for now, uh, you know, Good Alvarado, it's a pretty good look, you know. I mean, it's yeah. it's uh, it's not bad, but when he's not throwing strikes, like you just don't know. Yeah, good Jose Alvarado can be a top ten reliever in the league, mm-hmm. but he's not good consistently enough to even like put him close to that at the present time, at least. Uh, let's talk about Alec Bohm for a moment because he's been about as bad so far in 2021 as he was good in the 2020 debut the k rates up the walk rates down and the power really hasn't been there which is perplexing for a guy that hits the ball as hard as Bohm does i think it's just a young player going through a pretty typical sort of adjustment phase but do you see him being the kind of guy that can make enough adjustments to have a very productive second half or do you think we have more growing pain sort of looming here for these next few months so you look at his June and there were some tr- things that were trending upward. Um, he started to put the ball in play more, which was a plus. I mean, he was still striking out a lot, but uh, the power isn't there no. You know, and, and one of the things that they were working with, on with him before bringing him to the majors last year, one of the, you know, the finishing touch really what they would say is pull side power. He, he didn't display it a lot in the minors. It was something that they were working on him with. Like, he's got a great approach to all fields when he's right. Uh, and I think he's more of a gap to gap guy than he is a home run kind of power guy, which is not normal for a third baseman. So that that profile is a little more difficult there. But you're right. He's hitting the ball harder than he did last year. But just the contact, a lot of it is on the ground, so much on the ground. And for a guy his size at his position, uh, his stature really as a number three pick, uh, he's got to put the ball in the air a little more. Uh, and. I don't know. I mean, like he, he hit like 325 in June and he had like a 380 slug, which is that's hard to do. I mean, that's like Juan Pierre sort of territory there, right? Where you're like, you know, a hit for the high average, but all singles. And um, he went almost a full month without an extra base hit, which is insane. Uh, he's better than this. I think he is. The question is, is he as good as he was in 2020? And, and the answer is probably he's somewhere in between the 2020 guy we saw and, the, and what we've seen in 2021. Like you said, Derek is it going to come in the second half or is it coming in 2022? There's good signs so far. Uh, I think they went back to basics with him. Just get, you know, just, just put it in play. Like, don't try to, don't try to drive the ball. Just put it in play. They'll settle for the singles right now, but on, you know, fantasy wise, I mean, <laughs> like not, not really what you're looking for from a third baseman. Yeah, maybe get him some uh, Vladdy Jr. tape this offseason and to help him take that ground ball rate and throw some more of it to the fly ball. Uh, we look at this team. If you go back and look at what this team uh, was projected to do, the individual players on it, a lot of the guys are pretty much in line with their preseason projections and where they were expected to be at this point of the season. Anyone in this group you think is primed for a big second half? Hmm. Great question. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I always go with Reese Hoskins only because he is such a streaky hitter. And if he gets on one of those Reese Hoskins hot streaks, like, I mean, man, like it's, it's a good look like when he's on those hot streaks and we've seen, we saw glimpses of it uh, in the first half here. We also saw some incredibly bad stretches for him. Some long offers. Uh, he was really unlucky in June. You go look at the, the, the Babbitt, like it was like around, I think it was almost 100, I think in June, which is really weird. Um, He has, he has traded this, you know, he has traded walks for power this year, which is very uh, not like Reese Hoskins in the past. Even when he was going through those bad stretches, he would take his walks and get on base. He's not taking those walks as much as he is this year. I think he's trying to hit for a little more power. Uh, It's resulted in a weird sort of profile here, but I'll, I'll always, ride him for like a guy if you're like can i think big on like yes because like if he gets on a stretch he's the kind of guy who could carry an offense he really can the rest of the lineup i don't know you know like (laughs) bryce harper is clearly playing hurt uh 
Um, he has not been himself since he got hit in the face and then ricocheted off the wrist. He's got back injury, calf injury, shoulder injury, wrist injury. Um, like, you know, even though he he's hit for some power, it just it hasn't been consistent. McCutcheon has been sort of a weird profile all year. Um, started out poor, he's but he's taken his walks all year, and now he's hitting for power. Really interesting, I think. Um, I'm going to go with Hoskins, though. You know, I, I think he's a guy that uh, if he gets hot, like, it's pretty good. So we were joking before we started recording. This team has really just been kind of drifting for a long time. In my mind, as someone who doesn't cover this team, I just think about them more from an individual performance perspective. I always think of them as being closer to contending than they really have been. Where do you think they are a month from now? Are they actual sellers at the deadline? Because the NL East is a cluster, but it's hard to see without significant improvement from multiple players to see their baseline getting high enough where they're actually a playoff team as they're currently built. Right. It's like, how much do you really want to invest more into this roster? And that's, I think, the big question that's facing Dave Dombrowski and Sam Fold as they get to the deadline here. It's like, well, even if they are buyers, like they don't have a robust farm system, they don't have big prospects to trade or that they want to trade. So if they are buyers at the deadline, they're probably buying smaller pieces, right? Maybe you're looking at a setup guy, maybe a right-handed bat for the bench. Um, nothing, maybe a number four starter, if that's something that, you know, comes affordable. But I mean, obviously like the demand is going to outpace supply when it comes to starting pitchers at the deadline. I think that's pretty clear at this point. So if they're sellers, which again is totally plausible, I think you would just see them try to sell off spare parts. Like, I don't think they're blowing this up again. They can't. I mean, they can't. Like, look, like, <laughs> they tore it down. They rebuilt it. They have a really strong core. I mean, like, you look at Real Muto and Wheeler and Harper and Nola. I mean, that is a solid core there. They're in their primes. They're signed for the next few years. Like, you have to keep trying with that. So if they do sell, you know, I could see them trying to market Archie Bradley, Hector Neris, Andrew McCutcheon, uh, Didi Gregorius, who's about to come back. He's got another year gene segura has another year on his contract those kind of spare parts like i think is what they would try to move maybe like a vince velasquez if anyone's interested he's going to be free agent after this year i just don't see them selling off uh bigger pieces than that if it came to that um maybe they just try to get what they can for some of these guys on expiring deals or or uh, some veteran guys and try to do better next off season in, in, in filling out the roster around, you know, around the stars. I mean, it's a very top heavy roster. It's been that way for a few years now and they haven't uh, done a good job of building around it. Another confounding year for the Philadelphia Phillies and this year, even in the fantasy baseball world as well. That's Matt Gelb, our Phillies beat writer here at the athletic Matt. Thanks again for being with us on the athletic fantasy baseball podcast. Thanks guys. Have a good holiday. Yeah, you too. The beginning of any journey can feel daunting. You're not sure where you're heading. You're not sure if you're going in the right direction. Whatever the case may be, you don't really know exactly what to prepare for. With Credit Karma, you can be more involved and informed about what is ahead. Credit Karma's game-changing technology shows you tailored offers for credit cards and personal loans you're more likely to be approved for so you can apply with more confidence. What's better than that? They use your credit and other financial information to show you custom recommendations. Whether you want cash back, travel rewards, consolidate debt, whatever the case is here, Credit Karma can help you find the offers that fit your goals. With a selection of options and approval lines, you have the power to make informed decisions. And again, that is really the best bet you can make when you are doing something like this. Go to creditkarma.com slash podcast, nice and generic, to learn more and find offers tailored just for you. Again, that is creditkarma.com slash podcast, or you can see offers on the Credit Karma app. Apply with confidence today. Go to creditkarma.com slash podcast or the Credit Karma app. All right, DVR, let's get going here with the second half of our episode of the Athletic Fantasy Baseball Podcast here. As we talked about off the top of the show, All-Star Game right around the corner. So we've got some All-Star things to talk about in the fantasy baseball world as well. We can talk about a bunch of different things about All-Star. We could talk about just straight-up fantasy All-Stars. We could talk about return on investment All-Stars, the sort of guys who were drafted but really ended up playing way above their heads and have carried some fantasy teams to the top of the standings. But today, you and I are going to talk about a favorite breed of all-star, the waiver wire all-star. We know these guys come up every year, every sport, no matter what. We're going to find guys on the wire who ultimately end up being big-time 
fantasy player. So we'll go position by position, and we're actually going to take a look at a couple of different styles. We'll look at shallower leagues, guys who are the waiver wire all-stars there, and deeper leagues. Let's start, Derek, behind the plate. I feel like I feel like you did this on purpose. I feel like you really wanted to get some Brewers talk in right off the bat. So here we are, our catchers. Shallower leagues, Omar Narvaez. It's also got Mike Zunino and Eric Haas. Mike Zunino maybe gets a little bit more of the credit here for being the waiver wire all-star. But, I mean, all three of these guys have really uh, turned a corner in a big way for fantasy teams this season. Yeah, and I guess this is making an assumption that Isaiah Kiner Falefa and Buster Posey were more widely drafted than yeah, I think these that's guys. a good I think that's a fine assumption. At least Kiner Falefa was. There are probably some yeah. one catcher leagues where Posey was an early season waiver pickup and he obviously mm-hmm. belongs in the conversation too. But Narvaez was brutal in the shortened season. He's bounced back in a big way. He's a steady four category contributor mm-hmm. uh, for a catcher to this point. I think he's about fifteenth, inside the top fifteen at least, in roto value at the position this season so if you're in a two catcher league especially I mean if you drafted him in the 28th round or the 30th round you've been thrilled with the production that you've had to this point I feel like with Narvaez it's been a little bit easier to trust him since picking him up whereas Zanino is the kind of guy because of his track record of being a low batting average guy because Francisco Mejia is there sharing playing time with him a lot of the damage that Zanino has done has probably been while he was still on the wire (laughs) <laughs> or while he's been on the bench, kind of cycling in and out of the lineup. He's got 18 home runs so far this season, entering play on July 1st. The typical 210 average, but I'll take that batting average hit behind the plate because so many guys at that position have the elevated strikeout rate. They don't run well, so they're not going to do well on balls and play. Um, I do think when you look at Zanino, he, he could finish the year with 30 home runs, and it wouldn't be that much of a surprise. I think yep. the, the biggest threat to his playing time is... Mejia taking a step forward at the plate and continuing to wrestle away something close to 35 or 40 percent of the starts. But I think the Rays obviously like the way Zanino handles the pitching staff. That's why they brought him mm-hmm. back in the first place. Uh, and then you look at a guy like like Eric Haas. I mean, that's like an AL only pickup or a mm-hmm. very deep two catcher mixed league sort of pickup where you didn't expect anything and you got at least half dozen of those nine home runs that he's hit so far. So yeah. I don't know if that's going to continue at all. I'm, I'm not optimistic about him, but these guys have all really exceeded expectations relative to uh, where they were on draft day for sure. Yeah, something I love about Narvaez, and I actually do have him in a one-catcher league, picked up off the wire, a league where I drafted and immediately I would Austin Nola to start the season, and I didn't pick up Narvaez first. Um, I was dealing with some other catcher issues, and you know Nola's been on and off and more on the IL than off the IL this season. And the thing that attracted me to Narvaez is the rates. I mean, we typically don't expect to get rates from our catchers. And, you know, so I've built a full offense where, you know, I I know I'm going to get power here. I know I'm going to get seed here. And so to be able to go grab a catcher who can give you pretty reliable rates and Narvaez hitting 294, he's got a 394 OBP. So whichever rate your league uses, he is checking that box in a major major way you'd be happy with that from your first round pick if that was uh, yeah obviously you're not taking Omar Narvaez in the first round but if your first round pick was hitting 294 at a 394 OBP you'd be thrilled with that and you're getting that from a catcher you were able to scoop off the wire that's what I love about him for Zunino when we're talking about the catcher position I will almost always take someone who I know is going to do something even if it's just one thing if he's going to do that one thing reliably that right there puts him ahead of like half or maybe even more than of the catcher pool. And, and so I like that we've at least gotten that from Zunino with the power to this point of the season. So I do think that these guys are very worthy uh, waiver wire all-stars when we look at what they've provided. And Arman, Omar Narvaez just putting that 2020 season totally behind him. It was an anomalous season. He's proving that here this year. And I think projects as you know a very strong, perhaps top 10 catcher for the remainder of the season. Let's move on to the first base position here. DVR and you know first base has been something of a riddle the last few seasons uh, I still always think of it you know when I first got into uh, fantasy baseball in the late 90s and early 2000s you know first base was a position that was pretty deep it was not too hard to find good first baseman I mean, you could always find some easy power at this spot and it's changed a little bit in recent years where it's shallowed out a little and so the waiver wire has become I think more important than we typically expect it to be at this spot Nate Lowe Paven Smith, two guys who have delivered, whether you're in a shallow or a deep league. Yeah, Lowe was 
stealing some bases earlier in the year. That's tapered off quite a bit. I think he's got four for the year, and they all came back in April, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, really has secured the role at first base for the Rangers since that trade. And he's been more valuable than DJ LeMahieu, Anthony Rizzo, Josh Crazy. Bell. A lot of guys that we thought, I mean, LeMahieu was an early round pick. Rizzo wasn't that far behind him. He's probably a yep. top 75 guy in most leagues. And Bell, I think, even with a deflated price, was in the top 150. Mm-hmm. Uh, to see Nate Lowe outproducing those guys, counting stats especially, right? If you told me at the beginning of the season, DJ LeMahieu's going to be healthy. He's going to have more at-bats than Nate Lowe on July 1st. But Nate Lowe is going to be right in the same range in terms of run production. I would have laughed in your face because the <laughs> Yankees lineup was supposed to put uh-huh. a lot of runs on the board this year, and LeMahieu was supposed to be a big part of that. And that's not to say that LeMahieu's been a massive bust, but it gives you an idea of just where this position is at. There are some there's some guys that have surprised me. They're ahead of Nate Lowe, and I'm, I'm not sure where we go from here with him. I think he's a, a pretty difficult player for me sure. to evaluate and say, what are his chances of being a $15 player again in the second half? I would actually say not great because mm-hmm. that Rangers team will probably trade away a bat or two, so the quality of the lineup around him will go down. We've already seen him cool off, but I think one thing that gives Nate Lowe a decent floor is that he's always shown the ability to walk. So if he goes into a slump yeah. as a hitter, he's at least still getting on base. They have every reason to keep playing him, so even if you get five or six home runs in the second half instead of 10 or 12, I think you're going to be okay in deeper leagues. I think where you run into some troubles, if you picked up Nate Lowe in a 10 or a 12 team league, he might be a tick below what you want from the first base or the corner spot going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you just look at some guys who haven't quite lived up to their preseason expectations at this first base position, like, Dom Smith, would you rather have Dom Smith or Nate Lowe? Maybe Alec Bohm, who qualifies at first base, would you rather have him or Nate Lowe? I mean, is that the is that the the group of guys you put him in for the second half? I think so. Like if we were doing a draft today for the rest of the season, I think Lowe would probably go somewhere in the like one seventy five to two hundred range, right? He'd, mm-hmm. he'd be significantly up from where he was on draft day. He'd go a little bit later than he would have a month ago at some of those Memorial Day weekend second chance drafts, but. I think he would be uh, maybe in the Eric Hosmer range, right? Hosmer yeah. was one of those guys. That he's going to play. He's going to give you at least a decent batting average. The power comes and goes a little bit. Obviously, the Padres lineup is a lot better than the Rangers lineup, but mm-hmm. similar types of, of players from Roto production perspective. So um, a solid player, but maybe not necessarily the guy that we thought he was going to be through those first few weeks in April. Really quick here, Keston Hira or Nate Lowe, second half? I think I would take Hira, which is is me just being an optimistic <laughs> Brewers fan. I think the projections, I was looking at this kind of a preview for today's rates and barrels, but uh, we had someone ask us to look into the crystal ball and tell us who's going to take a step forward in the second half. And uh, long story short, the method I used highlighted Hira as one of the the biggest potential second half surgers. And I think we, we've seen his flaws on full display. Um, but the key difference for me is that I think the Brewers lineup will track towards being like a league average lineup going forward. So I think that that run production from Hira is probably going to be quite a bit better than the run production from Lowe the rest of the way. Uh, Maybe more power from Hira, less less batting average. I guess I'd rather have that combination than Lowe's floor at this point. Uh, Let's check out second base. Jazz Chisholm in the shallower side of things. Jonathan India and Luis Arias. And Luis Arias coming off a two-homer game yesterday. I mean, all these guys have been, I I think even though we're talking about India and Arias as deeper league waiver wire all-stars, that you could argue for them as second half players. And I think especially Arias in pretty much all formats with what we've seen from these guys. Jazz Chisholm, I mean, speak for himself. And what's more interesting about Jazz Chisholm is where does he go in the second half and where does he go in 2022 drafts? Yeah, I mean, I think the second question will shed some more light on the first one, but I think Jazz Chisholm is going through the adjustment phase that mm-hmm. many of us expected him to go through at some point. There was little reason to believe with a K rate as high as his K rate has been that it was going to be just smooth sailing all season long. Right. That being said, I would not be surprised, given that he's missed some time in the first half, if we saw another double-double, another 10-10, 10 homers, 10 steals from him in the second half, because the Marlins are not going to back off his playing time unless he goes into an extremely deep slump and has to go back to AAA, which I don't think at this point is necessary. They want him to learn at the big league level. 
Uh, so I think you're going to get those counting stats. You're probably getting less than a 256 average. All the projection systems have him at 231 or less. I think that makes sense for the short term. I don't think that's necessarily who he is in the long run. Uh, but he's had swing and miss in his game at every stop, and there aren't a lot of signs of that going away anytime soon. Mentioned Hero before. I mean, Keston Hira came up and was fantastic in 2019 with a K rate just above 30%. You can do a lot of damage if you barrel up the ball enough and you add speed. You can get away with that. Uh, but we do have to be very careful with that batting average category in particular with Jazz Chisholm. Yeah, I, I think you're totally spot on there. But the playing time is definitely going to be there for him. Uh, you know, what, what you love about Jonathan India is that he has fought his way to the top of this Cincinnati lineup and nothing's changing for him. And he's giving you six homers. He's giving you six steals. The rates have been pretty good. 262 batting average, 374 OBP for the season. And I think he's locked in, DVR. I think he's locked in atop that lineup. I mean, you know, Mike Moustakis is going to be back at some point, but I don't think that changes Jonathan India's playing time or his spot atop the lineup. Obviously, they have to move some things around to accommodate a returning Moustakis, but I just don't see how this team can go away from what India's given them at the top of the lineup. And so that gives me a lot of confidence in the sort of player he can be over the second half of the season. Yeah, India has done a lot of the things I was hoping that Nick Senzel was going to do for the Reds mm -hmm. this year. Maybe Senzel comes back in the second half and delivers on expectations once he's healthy again. But India versus Hira for you for the rest of the season. Their projections are actually very similar. I think I'm a little skeptical, relatively speaking, of India's power. But mm -hmm. at the same time, that park kind of goes a long way to mask that flaw. It, it really does. I, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm going to give the uh, annoying answer that it really is going to depend on your team context. I think if you need to take a shot on power, I don't think there's any argument for India over Hira. If you don't need to take the shot on power, I do think that I would rather go with Jonathan India here. I guess I'll say also, if you need to take a shot on overall upside, I think Hira is the play. Um, so power or upside, if that is driving that decision for you, give me Hira. If anything else is driving the decision for you, give me India. And it'll be interesting to see where this team goes. I mean, you know, Cincinnati seems to be underachieving a little bit yet again this season, but you can see the pieces of a strong offensive core, and India definitely is a part of that. So it'll be interesting to see if this team makes any moves at the deadline and where that sets them up for the second half and what that sets them up to do in 2022. But there we go at second base, Jazz Chisholm. Jonathan India and Luis Arias. Let's move on now to third base. Uh, Ray and a former Ray, Joey Wendell and Evan Longoria. I mean, obviously Longoria dealing with the injury, but I mean, he is, if there is a poster child for the Giants this year, maybe it's him, maybe it's Buster Posey, maybe it's Brandon Crawford. I, I, it's just crazy what they've done in Longoria at the center of it all. Yeah, unfortunately with that injury, he's had a, a break in his opportunity to continue piling up those numbers. Looked like he was on track for maybe a low 20s, maybe a 25 home run season with good run yeah. production and a good average to boot. So uh, I think there was a, a pretty good argument for Longoria to be even like the more, value, more valuable shallow league waiver wire all-star at third base. Wendell was one of those guys that every single time I looked at the playing time log and looked at his overall numbers, I kind of said, how is he doing this and, and why? <laughs> and, you know, part of his performance may have helped the Rays justify waiting as long as they have on Wander for what it's yeah. worth. And I, I do think the concern with Wendell is that he probably is more of a super utility sort of guy on a contending mm -hmm. team and not necessarily someone who has to be in the lineup each and every day. Just good overall skills, uh, has shown a little more power in recent years in Tampa Bay. That 2019 season looks like an outlier, probably some injuries playing a pretty big role there, especially since that was the year of the rabbit ball. So like, I'll readily admit I've been wrong about Wendell and probably underestimated what he could do from a power ceiling perspective. I thought he was a single digits guy consistently. Mm -hmm. I think 12 to 15 home runs over a full season is possible if the playing time pops because of injuries or because of a wander demotion or whatever it is that creates the opportunity i'm just not expecting as much playing time for him in the second half as he had in the first half yeah. barring some unforeseen events i mean in a world where the rays promote vidal brujan in the second half is wendell the guy who's like screwed i guess for lack of a better word uh, I, it's probably it's probably him i mean i'm sure obviously someone else would fall off the roster maybe yandy diaz takes a bit of a hit too uh -huh. even though Wendell and Diaz are opposite-handed guys, though. So 
it really depends on what they want to do with Bruhan defensively. I don't think they want to yeah. play him in the outfield because they've got other options out there. So mm-hmm. I would say Wendell loses a share, even if he's not the guy that loses the biggest share of playing time. Yeah, it's got to be him, and I think it's him and Diaz because it's not going to be Wander. It's not going to be Brandon Lau, I don't think. Um, and you're right about them. I don't think they want to use Bruhan in the outfield either. I mean, they like what Kevin Kiermaier gives them defensively in center field. So I think you're looking at an Arena Meadows, Kiermaier outfield basically locked for the Rays for the second half of the season. So I do think that if and when Bruhan is up, that it's probably Wendell and Diaz who, who lose the biggest chunk of playing time. But Been very good. Been very good to fantasy managers who scooped him up through the first half of the season. Let's get on to the shortstop position here, DVR, where we find a guy who we've already referenced, Isaiah Kiner for Leffa. I think it's fair to put him on here for shallow leagues. He certainly was drafted in deeper leagues, but in shallow leagues, maybe did fall off the draft radar. He has been just excellent in stealing bases, what he's been doing this season for the Rangers, a reason to watch the Rangers, certainly. And then, as we just referenced a little bit, Brandon Crawford, just part of this fountain of youth season for the Giants. Yeah, I mean, Kiner Falefa is 15 of 17 as a base dealer this Crazy. season. More efficient than ever, running more than ever. Gets it done with a low OBP. I mean, I'm wrong about him. I, I guess I was just wrong at how much... <laughs> you hated range- him. I did because I didn't think, (laughs) even though the defensive metrics are outstanding, he's a legitimately great defender on the left side of the infield, I didn't think the Rangers were going to give him everyday playing time. He's getting max volume, and players that get max volume playing time can be really good fantasy players, even if they're below average offensive players. Steals are gold right now. If you got 15 steals from one guy off the waiver wire, you are so happy halfway through the season, even if he loses a share of time, even if he runs less in the second half and you eventually have to cut him in some shallow leagues you banked all that production I think the batting average floor is probably a tick higher than I was giving him credit for too so uh, two thumbs up for me on Isaiah Kiner Falefa which I never thought I'd say I thought he'd be the (laughs) kind of guy that would be a bit like Wendell more of a a super utility sort of guy because of his defense who uh, would have value in AL only leagues and situational Mm -hmm. value in mixed leagues when he was getting more playing time than expected but he's been better than that Brandon Crawford, second half expectations. Obviously, it's not going to be the first half. We talked about this with Derek Cardi. Was I believe that was just last week's episode or maybe two weeks ago when we had Derek on the show. We talked about just why projection systems aren't loving Brandon Crawford for the second half of the season. It's totally understandable. Uh, but expectations for him, he is in a little bit of a slump right now, which obviously was coming eventually for him. Where do you think about Brandon Crawford for the second half of the season at this uh, shortstop position? I think he holds value, at least in 15-team mixed leagues, as a middle infielder. Mm -hmm. I think in a a 12-teamer, it's a little bit like the Nate Lowe situation that we described earlier where I I don't know if he can sustain this pace, even if he sustains a pace above the projection going forward. I I look at him as a guy that could be a little bit of a liability uh, in those more shallow formats because I think the per-game production is going to lag a bit relative to other players at the position. You mentioned before, first base, Used to be plentiful when we started playing fantasy baseball. It was easy to find guys on the wire, Mm -hmm. plenty of mashers to go around. Shortstop is way better now than it used to be, and and that has raised the bar for someone like Crawford to continue making a shallow league impact. But what a great story. What a great job by the Giants just from a a development perspective. I know our buddy Eno Saris wrote a great piece about that earlier this week for The Athletic, and uh, I I don't want to be the guy that reigns in the parade all the time. I just I look at Crawford as a guy that still – tracks better in those deeper mixed leagues than in shallow ones. There's a story to be written, and maybe some of it's been written, but there's, uh, I think, a long-ranging story to be written, especially as some of these guys have gotten a little bit older at how shortstop has turned into this offense, almost offense first position. Not quite offense first, because it's the most important defensive position out there, but just, a, a, you know, you, like Carlos Correa, Corey Seager, you know, those guys with that body type are not sticking at shortstop if they are 20 years older. And so there's some story to be written about how just like, I guess the evolution of athleticism has made it okay for guys like that to be shortstops and be these great hitters while still carrying their weight defensively. But we're not here to write that story. We're here to talk about waiver wire all-stars. Let's jump into the outfield. We've just got three apiece uh, for shallow and for deep leagues. And again, the deep league ones, I mean, Cedric Mullins, unbelievable the season that he's put together. Adolis Garcia, obviously it's been, you know, not quite as consistent, but he has been a great story this year. You could talk about these guys as shallow leaguers going forward. They qualify for us in the deep league discussion as we're looking at waiver wire all-stars, but 
I mean, especially Cedric Mullins. I mean, what a, what a year he's having. This guy is someone who we are going to be really excited about, I think, in 2022. Yeah, I saw a projected AL All-Star lineup that had Mullins leading off because yeah. uh, of Mike Trout's injury and his inability to play in the game. Mullins is absolutely a deserving real-life All-Star, uh, gave up switch hitting, and has just been outstanding for the Orioles. Looks like a guy that might be on the next playoff team in Baltimore. I mean, that's the type of, of longevity that he might bring to the table. And I think, we, just to clarify, we did group these players just sort of based on uh, the types of leagues that they might have been available in the beginning right, of the season right. because Mullins was firmly on the radar as a late round guy in a lot of NFBC leagues. Mm -hmm. uh, but if if you were if you're playing in you know a, a, even in a 15 team league, there he still wasn't a lock to have playing time right away. So that's why he got bumped in there. Like he's clearly played his way into shallow league consideration months yeah. ago. He did that. I mean, by the end of April, people were picking him up in 10 team leagues, and he's still rostered there. Uh, but I think Brian Reynolds is one of those guys. Like His shortened season was miserable. I think it was so <laughs> easy to look at what he did in 2019 and what he did in 2020 and say, 19 was an outlier, rabbit ball guy, the league figured him out, and there's no way he'll get back to that 2019 level. Well, it turns out he's better than he was in 2019 so far. So to me, that's one of those really interesting stories. Uh, when we talked to Zach Meisel earlier, he mentioned a controllable center fielder being something that mm -hmm. Cleveland would want. The Pirates would probably be wise to trade Reynolds because they're further away in their rebuild anyway. You know, outfielders mm -hmm. relatively easy to get. So if you could go get mm -hmm. three or four prospects in a deal for Reynolds, that's probably worth it if you're Pittsburgh. So I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Reynolds ends up being that guy that ends up in Cleveland. Another consideration there is that, I mean, the White Sox probably want Brian Reynolds yesterday with all the injuries that that team's had, with all the poor performance they've had in the outfield and just a team that's been desperate for a, for a right fielder. <laughs> I do that all the time. I'm always bumping bumping coffee mugs into my mic. Pro uh, tip, pro though. tip. Don't yeah. watch yourself. Don't watch yourself with the coffee mug in the video return when you're doing video. Look at the mug. Turn your face away from the camera yeah. and just take a drink of your coffee so you don't hit the microphone with it. <laughs> so good. Anyways, the White Sox are going to want Brian Reynolds. I think the White Sox are very, very, very much. I mean, the White Sox would probably love like a Brian Reynolds, Adam Frazier package deal from Pittsburgh. And so if Cleveland has the horses to make that deal and block the White Sox from getting Brian Reynolds and also get that get him and themselves be very wise to do that how about Tyler O'Neill I mean just you know this was a season that always seemed like it could be in the cards for Tyler O'Neill with the power and I feel like it's being a little bit superseded by the fact that the Cardinals are just a kind of a bad team this year maybe a mediocre to bad team this year and so it's being overlooked the fact that hey Tyler O'Neill He's having that year that a lot of people thought he could have, you know, even just a couple of years ago when this is going to be a big piece for fantasy managers and the Cardinals into the future. Yeah, looking at the projections for O'Neal going forward, he actually looks pretty similar on paper to Randall Gritchick, uh, an often underrated fantasy player in Toronto, maybe because of the real-life contract extension he signed and, and some of his flaws. Like, we we give Gritchick this sort of, of bad rap, or at least he mm -hmm. gets that for some reason. Uh, I think with O'Neal, he's always going to strike out a bit. He's shown in recent years he can walk a little bit more than he did when he came into the league. So I think that's somewhat encouraging too. No doubts about the power. And I think the other thing that makes him a little bit sneaky is that he's got six steals in 62 games. He probably finishes this year with at least 10 and possibly as many as 15, depending on how many green lights he gets. So uh, doing a lot of things right and you know probably not necessarily going to be uh, – a top 100 fantasy player like draft wise at any point, but definitely a guy that should be pretty consistently rostered because he's able to contribute in at least four categories, but possibly mm -hmm. all five. Other outfielders on our waiver wire all-star team that we didn't talk about in any sort of depth. I have a Garcia, again, Adolis Garcia and Tyler Naquin joining Brian Reynolds, Tyler O'Neill and Cedric Mullins. We've got a utility spot here, obviously uh, in actual fantasy leagues, you can use your utility however you want it for the sake of this conversation. We, uh, considered this spot to be a DH. And so even though he has really slowed down over the last couple of months, we're still giving it to your mean Mercedes. Yeah, if you picked him up in a deeper league and ran him out there for that first three to four weeks where he was tearing the cover off the ball, you were really happy. Things have clearly taken a turn, though, since the early part of May, really. Uh, I, I don't know. 
I don't know if the what are they going to do with Abreu and Vaughn and Mercedes question <laughs> yeah. that we were asking. Uh, what happens when Eloy comes back? Is there even a spot for him? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we're necessarily worried about that anymore. I think this is regression hitting hard as it yeah. tends to do, and it was a, a fun story while it lasted. But yeah, I, I I don't think there are a lot of shallow mixed leagues where you can justify having Mercedes on your roster, or especially in your active lineup in the second half. One year from now, are we talking about your mean Mercedes as the next great entry in the line of Chris Shelton and Brian LaHare and players like that? Yeah, he's probably a lot more like a Brian LaHare than <laughs> than a guy like a, a late bloomer, like a Nelson Cruz or the kind of guy that we're yeah. going to have playing for 10 plus years beyond this this late arrival. Definitely a fun story, though, in this first half of the 2021 season. Let's move on to our starting pitchers. So I'm just going to list all the guys. DVR, you can pick any of the ones that you want to talk about. Taiwan Walker, Trevor Rogers, Carlos Rodon, Anthony DiSclefani, Kyle Gibson, and Luis Garcia. All these guys 100% rostered across the fantasy universe. It's been a great season for these six. Yeah, I mean, you can take your pick Rogers mm -hmm. in most of the leagues I play in was firmly on the radar by the end of spring Same. training if not at the beginning but he continues to impress he looks excellent looks like an actual frontline guy for the Marlins mm -hmm. so uh, just credit to him and their development side whatever they're able to do to unlock everything for him uh, he looks outstanding is he a top 25 starting pitcher here on out like I, I probably wouldn't push back on that if you I think made he is, that claim. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think he's that good. I think the, the deeper league guys that you can see if you're watching us on YouTube over to the right, Rodon and Desclafani, Gibson and Garcia. Rodon is a great story just because he's overcome mm -hmm. so many injuries and obviously through the no-hitter earlier this year and just looks like the guy that we saw when he was first breaking in with the White Sox several years ago. I think that's what has been so exciting about his turnaround and I would say he's probably more of a high threes ERA and a 120s whip guy in the second half, but that's really good. I mean, that's still very playable, especially since the the bar for pitching is coming down, right? With the sticky right. stuff and enforcement, with spin rates dropping off a bit, some of the ridiculous numbers we were seeing from pitchers early in the year, those are going away. I also think hitters after the long layoff last year for a lot of the minor league players and, and for guys that were part-time guys in the big leagues, hitters are going to be less rusty in the second half. Offense always ticks up around August anyway. Um, so we do have to kind of rethink the baselines for pitching late in the year. Gibson, I didn't see coming at all, but I think mm -hmm. it's another check mark for the Rangers finding value in second tier and lower free agent pitching. Like they did it with Lance Lynn. Uh, they mm -hmm. did it with Mike Minor a couple of years ago. Uh, there's a lot of things that are not going right in Texas, but this seems to be a skill that this organization has at this point and then Garcia I, I have quite a bit of Garcia because even though they didn't have a clear spot for him when the season started he made the leap from high a last year really held his own some of the underlying numbers we talk a lot about on rates and barrels really popped for him uh, so I'm just excited that by process that that was a, a good decision and I would say of all of the guys uh, on the right side the Rodon Desclafani Gibson Garcia group He's the guy that I'm actually the most confident in. I think the reason I'm concerned about Rodon is just past health. Gibson mm -hmm. could end up on a better team, which is nice. And Desclafani, I think, is in a park that really is the opposite of Cincinnati in terms of how it <laughs> squashes home runs. Uh, but I do think Desclafani probably hits some pretty hard regression in the second half, even if he's yeah. still very rosterable. Yeah, I'm with you there. And Gibson is, I mean, Gibson, there, there's a chance that Gibson's the best pitcher traded at the deadline, as uh, we were talking about with Zach earlier. Everyone wants pitching. No one really wants to give it up. The Rangers are going to be all too happy to trade Kyle Gibson, especially if he is getting top pitcher on the market rates. And I think we could see that. So he definitely could end up on a better team. Garcia, I feel like he feels locked into this Houston rotation. And we know that Jose Urquidy just went on the IL. So you still have a situation where even with Urquidy on the IL, Christian Javier can't break into this rotation. Garcia, the, it, it feels as though if he were ever going to transition out of the rotation, it would have happened by now. So I think we can safely keep Garcia in that rotation. So I'm with you, a guy who uh, definitely has a, a very bullish outlook for the second half of the season. But all these guys, from Walker all the way on through to Luis Garcia, uh, all guys who are going to be fantasy fixtures for the remainder of the season. Let's wrap this up by looking at the bullpens DVR. We've got a couple of guys here in Lou Trevino and Yimi Garcia who have been great in the first half. 
but could go in divergent way paths in the second half because Lou Trevino on a contending Oakland team, he's locked in. They've got him as the closer. Yimi Garcia, he's been great for Miami, but he could find himself in a spot where he is no longer a closer. So I think maybe we're in a position where if you are a Yimi Garcia manager, enjoy what you've had for the first half because he might be setting up somewhere come the second half. Yeah, I really don't see a scenario where he gets dealt somewhere else and gets the the bulk of the saves barring injuries in his new bullpen and even then, I'm still a little bit skeptical because of the longer-term issues he's had keeping the ball in the park. Trevino looks like just another success story in Oakland. It took a few years for him to really get to this sort of level, uh, but 13 saves from the wire is nothing to sneeze at. I would throw a honorable mention out there for Jonathan Lewisaga, too. Um, yeah. Not really getting many saves. He's got two, but he's got seven wins this year. And in 42 and two-thirds innings, a 232 ERA and a whip below one. So even a, a non-closer reliever like Loisaga can have a lot of value if you happen to find the guy that like, basically piles up wins for you unexpectedly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tyler Rogers, uh, um, uh, uh, Giovanni Gallegos, another guy who has been very good in that sort of role. I'm always going to beat the drum. You know it, DVR. Let's start getting some value to those guys, even if it means including holds in your fantasy league. I'm going to have to have like a 20-minute segment where I can go off on this, but we don't have time for it here. We're going to have to call it an episode, as you see Derek put his hand into his head here. Uh, That's going to be it for the Athletic Fantasy Baseball Podcast for this episode. Of course, you know what to do if you want to get in the door, $3.99 a month. Go to theathletic.com slash fantasy baseball podcast for Derek Van Riper, for Zach Mizell, for Matt Gelb. I am Michael Beller. Enjoy your next couple of days. Enjoy the holiday weekend. On that holiday weekend, note DVR and I are kicking up a waiver episode. Usually on Sunday, we're going to be doing it on Friday this week to keep the fourth clear. So be on the lookout for that. We'll have that for you, and then we'll be back with you next week with Under the Radar. Until then, happy holidays, enjoy the weekend, and we'll talk to you soon.